All right, welcome back. So now we're going to start to get a little bit more complex. And this lecture is going to talk about the echinoderms and the chordate. So the last bit of our invertebrates, and then we'll introduce what it means to be a vertebrate. So let's just remind ourselves where we're at. So we've been going through all the different groups, and we are now to this right here. So we're talking about those that are true deuterostomes. So remember, mouth second, they develop their anus first. So we're going to, we've been talking about everything else, but now we are talking about those that developed with the mouth, mouth second. Now the echinoderms, these are going to be, um, they're going to have tiny skeletal bones and they have like a true endoskeleton. And this is going to be mostly your sea stars when you think about them. And then we're going to talk about the chordates. So I'm going to introduce most of them, but I want to introduce one subphylum real quick are phylum hemichordata. Now, the book really doesn't mention these, but I just want to kind of introduce them a little bit to you. So this is um, the acorn worm, about 100 species fall in this group right here. You're going to finally primarily find them in marine sediments, and they're going to have a three-part body where they're going to have a proboscis, a collar, and then a trunk right there. And then they do have a true respiratory, digestive, and reproductive system, and they can be found in solitary or actually live in colonies. Not a lot of information on them. I just wanted to introduce because he's kind of like a in-betweener when it comes to the different phylums. But one that a lot of people seem to love is this phylum at Echinogodermata. So these are you're going to be your sea stars, your sand dollars, your sea urchin, and your sea cucumbers. A lot of diversity within about 7,000 species. Now all of these are going to be marine dwelling and bottom dwelling animals of there. Now they have this thing called pentaradial symmetry. So some of them have five arms. You'll see some of them that have more, depending on the type of species. And they're, what's unique about them is they're going to be bilateral during early larval stages. Now they have that true endoskeleton, which is made of those tiny little ossicles. And we also have a true coelom, which has been modified into this water vascular system. And they use that water vascular system both for movement, uh, for gas exchange, and nutrient circulation. Now, what's really cool about these guys is they go through the process of regeneration. So even when 75% of the body is lost, it can regenerate all of its arms. So here's a cool video that kind of talks about that. Well worth the watch. And then they go through both sexual and asexual reproduction, just some of the key points on them. So a little bit about the physiology. They have that central ring canal that's in the middle. Boom, 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 boom. And then they're going to have these radial canals that go off it. They're going to have a mouth on the oral or the ventral side. And then that's going to open up to their cardiac stomach that they can expel the whole stomach for feeding. It's kind of cool. Um, this is a video that kind of talks about the tube feet. And then I think one of the other videos talks about how they actually eat. Now, they use these little on their tube feet. Um, they stick through little openings and they use them for movement. They can actually use hydrostatic pressure and that stuff. They can use them to move, grab onto things. They're quite cool when you look about them. Now, they do have a nervous system where they're going to have a nerve ring. Boom, boom, boom. I'm trying to highlight it right there. When there's five radial nerves, but they do not have a true central nervous system. So that's why they're able to like chop off a whole part and then regenerate into another organism, which is kind of cool. So let's talk about a little bit about the diversity that falls into this group. Um, class Asterodia, which are your sea stars. About 800 species, and these some of these can be quite beautiful. They're going to have those really thick arms. So these are like the true starfish you're used to seeing. So these thick arms will extend from the central disc, and they're going to have various body organs branched within each of the arms. Now, at the end of each arm, is going to be a simple eye spot. And what's really neat about these guys are carnivores, so they love to eat mollusks. So here's that video I was talking about where it shows them like actually prying open a mollusk and getting a nice little lunch. Class Ophiridata, I'm saying that wrong, which are happen to be your brittle stars. They're quite delicate when you think about it. So your previous class had the really thick arms. These are going to be very long, thin, and flexible. And they use them to wrap themselves around objects and pull themselves forward because they really don't have those true two feet. And they're going to use these arms to actually grasp their prey too. Really quite delicate when you look at them. Now, classic kinodera, 
might be saying that wrong to you, are your sea urchins and your sand dollars. What's unique about these groups, this group right here, is they do not have arms. It's one major thing that you should notice with them. Now they're going to be that hemispherical or flattened with five rows of two feet that are extended through five rows of pores on that continuous internal shell. Um, these are mostly going to be graders and suspension feeders when you think about it because they think about where they, you find most of them in these like tide pools or um, if I was a kid I would hunt for sand dollars underneath the cell uh, underneath the sand in the shallow water. And then the last part of this is the um, class Crinodia are your sea lilies are your feather stars. These are actually quite beautiful too within this group. Now what's unique about these are their sessile and their body is attached to a stalk, so they just attach to a certain area. That means they have to be suspension feeders, and these little feathers are going to have tiny two feet on them. So they're quite beautiful when you think about them. Oh, another one, sorry. Thought I was done. So now we have class whole through. Oh my God, holo through. We ah, I should have practiced all these before I started recording. My apology. Which are your sea cucumbers? So they're going to have the a suspended oral aboral axis, and depending on what stage they are, we'll have bilateral versus radial symmetry. Now their two feet are going to be very reduced when you think about them. Are completely absent. It depends on what side of the animal you're looking at, but they might be underneath, and they are also suspension feeders. Now they're starting to fail me. So let's move on to talking about the chordates. So they're going to have four key features. So we're talking previously everything what before us was the invertebrates, so now let's move into the vertebrates. So when we're talking about something to be called a vertebrate, there's going to be four key features that we're going to look for. First off is a notochord. So this is this flexible rod-shaped structure between the digestive tube and the nerve cord. So think of about, boom, right there. Now, it's going to be present during embryonic development vertebrates. After birth, uh, birth we convert that into our vertebral column. So you have to have that notochord. Next is we look for a dorsal hollow nerve cord. It's going to be located right above the notochord, and this is going to develop into the brain and the spinal cord. Next up, we look for pharyngeal slits. Now, in aquatic environments, they allow the exit of water, and as a mat, a water that enters the mouth during feeding in some organisms, they'll filter food. Um, fish, they will become the gills and touch upon. So um, there will become the components of the tonsils and the ears. So in early development, you're going to have these pharyngeal slits. And then a postanal tail. So all vertebrates at some point in their life have a postanal tail made of skeleton and muscle. Some of them will keep it. Some of them will get rid of it. And fish, they use it for locomotion. Um, some terrestrial invertebrates use them for balance, locomotion, cording, and communication. And what I've noticed uh, or stated in many species is present in the embryo but not in an adult. So you had a tail at one point in your life. Fascinating, I know. So we're getting into the more complex ones. So we are going to talk about these two clades of uh, chordates that are kind of fall in between. Um, they technically are invertebrates, but they have enough of the distinct features that they have are considered chordates as some part of their development. So I want to talk about them just a little bit. Um, they're kind of fall early on right here. These are the early ones, but they are kind of like this in-betweeny stage. So they're not like a true vertebrate, but they're not a true vertebrate. They're kind of an in-betweener, but let's talk about them. So first one is cephalocordata. These are going to be your lancelets. So if you kind of look at them right there, it looks very similar to the picture that we were talking about, the four key things. Now the notochord on these guys is going to extend far into the head, but it doesn't have a well-defined brain. If you look at these guys, it kind of looks like a primitive fish. Now these guys are going to be suspension feeders, but they have those four key things that does classify them at some point in their life to be an actual vertebrate. And you're going to find these in the bottom of warm temperature and tropical seas. A lot and a lot of information on them. And then finally, subphylum Eurocordata, which are your tunicates, are your sea squirts. Not your sea squirts, sorry. About 600,000 species. Now, they do have the cellulose carbolite 
carbohydrate materials surrounding their body and you would think that this is something that um, would qualify as a vertebrate but the adults don't have the notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, or a postanal tail, but the larvae stage does. So that's why it falls into this in between. -y. You're kind of like a chordate, but you're not. Um, it's kind of interesting. The larvae stage looks completely different than the adult stage, which is right here. They can farm these solitary um, little tubes, arcalis, and colonies. And then they can actually reproduce by the process of budding. So kind of weird that this falls into the vertebrae thing, but it has to do at some point in your late during development, they had those four key characteristics. And then finally, we're going to spend some time talking about subphylum vertebrata. So this is going to be those that have that true characteristics of being a vertebrate that you're used to. We're going to start to see a few key things. They're going to have a cranium, which is that bony cartilages or fiber structure surrounding the brain. We'll start to see jaw and facial bones start to appear. Most of them are going to be bilateral symmetrical, and they're going to have a true head region. They're going to have that column, that vertebral column that we're talking about. And this is the largest group of chordates. We kind of mentioned the other two, how they were kind of an in between -y. These pretty much, depending even in early stage and later stage, you can see those key characteristics. And there's about 62,000 species. And we're going to break them up into smaller groups in the next couple of lectures. So here's some review, mostly fun videos, and then credit for the images.